So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, the Dr. Lee Seng T of Singapore is the great benefactor who makes these lectures possible. And he's been a great benefactor to the university and to Wolfson College. And I have to mention that as that happens to be my college, so I'm uh, doubly delighted to be here today. But his intention in establishing this lecture series, uh, which was founded in 2001, was to provide a forum, a forum in Cambridge for discussion of significant public policy implications of scientific, medical or technological research and its developments. These have been edified by six lecturers to date. The first in 2003 was Sir John Salston, whose work uh, with the uh, MRC of uh, Laboratory for Molecular Biology led very much to the human genome sequencing. The second was Sir David King, formerly head of the uh, Cambridge Chemistry Department and then Government Chief Scientific Advisor. And then um, a Miliband, not Ed, David, uh, who came here when he was uh, subsequently Foreign Secretary, um, having made that leap to government to talk to us about the implications of policy in the foreign sphere. And in 2008, the lecturer was a head of state, Paul Kagami of Rwanda, who spoke on the policy uh, challenges of building viable medical research communities in Africa. And then lastly, in 2011, we welcomed Tachi Yamada, outgoing head of the Global Health Programme at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. So Helga, no pressure on you then. Um, <laughs> but she joins this illustrious list and is hugely uh, illustrious in herself. Today, it's a particular pleasure to welcome her back to Cambridge because she's kept very hidden the fact that some time ago in 1972-73, she was a research fellow here at King's. Um, it's amazing what you can find out in Cambridge. It's amazing how many great people have been through here. So um, it's, it's a real pleasure to welcome you back. She's a pioneering figure in the social sci studies of science, receiving the field's highest award, the J.D. Bernal Prize. She's widely known for her work on science in society, including influential books such as The New Production of Knowledge, which celebrates its 20th anniversary this year, and Rethinking Science. These books have shaped thinking about the changing nature of scientific enterprise, and I know they're very good because even a scientist like myself has read them, not just those uh, coming from her field. And Professor Novotny has been passionately committed to supporting interdisciplinary dialogue between the natural and the social sciences, and recently co-authored a book with a molecular biologist, Giuseppe Testa, on naked genes reinventing the human in the molecular age. But not content with all of this, and with this prolific career as an academic studying the organisation of science and society, she decided to take the practical course as well. And we all know uh, Helga as uh, the founding member of the European Research Council, serving as its president since March 2010. And it's during that period that I've had the privilege of meeting and working with her on so many occasions. It is in this role that she's made a significant, and we hope a very lasting contribution. Because make no mistake about it, the European Research Council has changed the shape of the way in which Europe is perceived uh, as an organisation that can play a serious role in science in the 21st century. And it's down so much to the work that she has done there. So I am personally privileged and delighted to turn to Professor Novotny and invite her to deliver the 2013 Dr. S.T. Lee Public Policy Lecture, The Odds for Tomorrow, Promises, Policy and the Publics Under Conditions of Uncertainty. Helga Novotny. Vice Chancellor, Chancellor, distinguished guests, colleagues and friends. It's indeed a very great pleasure for me to be back and this morning I had a bit of time to walk around in Cambridge and it brought back old memories. I am particularly honoured also to be the seventh speaker in this very distinguished series and I have chosen my title triggered by the title of a book <coughs> called The Odds Against Tomorrow. This is a book by Nathaniel Rich. 
It is a comical book full of apocalyptic visions. And it is a good play um, in terms of satire on the fears that plague our age. The main character of that book is someone by the name of Mitchell Sukor, and he's a very talented warrior, spelled with an O, warrior, not warrior. Uh, he relishes in disaster, and he works for a firm that is selling risk assessments so that later on the victims can claim in court that they foresaw the disasters coming. And I thought something must be done and someone must speak up against these odds against tomorrow. So this is my title, The Odds for Tomorrow. I will take you through these uh, brief uh, five chapters. And I will begin <clears throat> with uh, the first one between fear and confidence. Now, <clears throat> since the beginning of humanity, we know that people have been craving for certainty. Some of the oldest archaeological artifacts are bones with carvings in them, and archaeologists tell us these were the early oracles where people tried to foresee what will happen in the future. Prophecies are not so popular anymore, but there is one kind of prophecy that we all are uh, engaged in, namely self-fulfilling prophecies. And especially on the financial markets, we have seen how much uh, power a self-fulfilling prophecy uh, can have, but not only there. Predictions capture our minds <clears throat> and our actions. Nathan Silver recently, in his book, The Signal and the Noise, has tried to put some order <clears throat> by distinguishing and describing those predictions that uh, can be made and predictions that are unlikely to succeed and therefore have to fail. We somehow seem to have gone out of the fashion of looking at long waves, maybe because the Kondratiev cycles uh, with their 55 years are too long for our quick age, but we still have cycles of boost um, and bust. <clears throat> And these cycles of boost and bust uh, remind us also that perhaps there is this ongoing acceleration. Time is out of joint, as Shakespeare called it once. But what uh, is undermining the craving for certainty are the unintended consequences of intentional action. And this is really the core mission of what social scientists try to find out. What are the unintended consequences that, were, uh, that steer us off the course we want to take? The most difficult of it all is how to think not only the changes that we can observe in society, that we can describe, that we can analyze, but at the same time integrate it with the way how our knowledge about society and about nature interlinks with what we see in terms of changes in society. Let me take a quick uh, step back to what I call changing profiles of fear. Each age, you can say, has different kinds of fears. And it's sometimes quite, um, quite good to go back and to be reminded of some of the fears that plagued people, for instance, in the Middle Ages. Some of the fears are familiar, fears about war, fears about illness, uh, etc. But other fears appear to us utterly strange. For instance, the Lumont describes, uh, in terms of historical evidence that, that was found, that at one particular point, cemeteries were relocated outside the city walls. Now, you may think uh, this had to do and this is the rational explanation, of course. Uh, it had to do with the fact that you wanted to have a sanitized place inside the city walls. But according to historians, this is only part of the explanation. The other part was that the city dwellers 
wanted to prevent the debt of coming back. And this to us is one of these very strange fears that is very difficult for us to understand and get into the mindset. And yet history is full of such imagined fears. Barbara Tuckman, another <clears throat> very well-known book, uh, the, the 14th century, takes the figure of one uh, knight and uh, she shows how unpredictable life was in the 14th century. This particular person, he could be invited to court one day and he was well received by uh, the court authorities the next day, he could end up in prison. And history is full of these <coughs> stories. And this also is uh, something that of course had to do with the way and what people were afraid of. And uh, Keith Thomas, this is my, my last historical ex example, a wonderful book <coughs> on religion and the decline of magic here in, <coughs> in Great Britain. And he shows how superstition all of a sudden disappeared when a more scientific and technological um, <clears throat> solutions were provided to people's fears. For instance, one example I remember very vividly, uh, a lost object instead of uh, doing all kind of superstitious practices to find the lost object again, you could place an ad in the newspaper and your object was perhaps likely to return. So <clears throat> this is just the historical reminder that in our age we have again a different profile of what we are afraid of and the anxieties that plague us. Um, the Pew uh, survey, this is a, a global survey that uh, is conducted in some 40 countries, also asks what people are afraid of and the answers are terrorism, financial instability, climate change surveillance. And this is just something that you and everyone who reads the newspaper every day is familiar with. Now, <clears throat> fear uh, is not related only to um, the present. It's also related to the future. But the future itself, the concept, the imagination we have of the future is also changing. It's no longer what it used to be. And Reinhard Koselleck is a German historian who worked <clears throat> on the um, 18th century, and he called it subtle Zeit, the, the, the settled time this, uh, in, in the middle of the uh, 18th century, where he shows that it was for the first time with the onset of modernity as he saw it, a gap appeared between people's experience and their expectations. And the notion of the future towards an open horizon that was not predetermined by the past started to take root at that particular moment in time. And if we look <clears throat> at um, the 18th century, beginning with the 17th century, of course, it's intimately connected to the rise of modern science. And there, historians of science tell us that for a very long time, the Baconian program that you are all familiar with, the ideas of the Enlightenment that were uh, sweeping through Europe, all of these beliefs in modern science, in progress, were not answered right away. There was a long stretch where you just were building on the belief that there would be improvements in the human condition, that science would provide the key to these improvements, but to wait for it actually to happen took much, much longer. And <clears throat> Joel Moke, a wonderful uh, economic historian, in his book again on the uh, economic history of Britain during this time, he makes the point, he calls it ideology, but it is this belief in progress the knowledge, the technology, but also institutions were crucial to um, sweep through the economy and actually to bring about the changes. But he also makes the point in the beginning, there was this uh, way forward in terms of hoping for the future uh, to be delivered 
by modern science and technology. Now, <clears throat> let's take a quick look at what has become of the future today, if I may put it this way. The future with a capital F has disappeared and historians will know what I mean. What we see today are futures in the plural. The English language is not equipped to express it, nor the German or French language. And these futures seem to us fragile, they seem to us volatile, and also shrinking. The uh, Limits of Growth, the Club of Rome study that was uh, commissioned, I had uh, once the opportunity, it was financed by the Volkswagen Stiftung, and I had the opportunity to um, look through the archives of the Volkswagen Foundation in terms of analyzing the reviewing process of that study, which was a very interesting experience for me. And let me just tell you very briefly, all the natural scientists were for it and the political scientists were against it. But the Volkswagen Stiftung got it through. But rereading, this was an occasion for me to reread the book. And I was struck by the certainty of the notion of future that pervades the entire study. Of course, the whole point was, through the various scenarios, to shake people up, to disrupt, as you would say today, to disrupt people's thinking unless we do something to change the way how we uh, treat nature services. Um, the catastrophe would be inevitable. But there was this, for me, really almost shocking belief the future is certain and we can speak about the future that will happen. Of course, what also added at that time, this was really the first study that was based on computer simulation. And for most of the readers, and I think this is part of the success of the book that was translated into, I don't know how many languages and sold millions and millions of copies, was that a computer could predict what is happening in the future. So you had this you know, technocratic awe at that time, but it, it, it was striking. Compared to what we witness today, nobody can claim that we are feeling certain future is always uncertain, but that we feel to have some ground to be able to say something meaningful about what will happen. And the way how I see it is that we are so overburdened in the present, coping with its complexities of daily life, coping with the complexities of uh, the world with all its conflicts and challenges, um, <coughs> climate change and so on that it's, uh, the present sort of absorbs and um, overwhelms us and there is very little time left to think and give time to thinking and imagining the, the future. Crisis used to be a turning point, the original meaning in the medical sense of crisis. And it used to be, uh, as a metaphor, also used in this way. But now it has become an almost um, endless process, a perpetuating turning point, if something like this exists. If we look on the subjective side, and there are social psychologists and others who are doing this, there is this MMPI, which is the Minnesota Multiface Inventory. This is a uh, survey um, that is done on US college students since the 1940s. And looking back, one can see an increase in people's distress, dissatisfaction with life, etc. So it's. Uh, the direction is, is very clear, and also other uh, psychological uh, surveys tell us that there is this decrease in the sense of control, or the way how psychologists put it. Um, people have the feeling it's no longer themselves, the inner locus of control is shifting towards the outside, and therefore this is seen as destabilizing and as threatening. Now, the future 
has also a lot to do with the way how it reflects back on our actions. And here I am taking um, the, the work of uh, Frank Knight, who was an uh, American economist, he, who in 1921 made this distinction between uncertainty and risk in economic terms. And for him, and I have adapted this to danger to make the distinction between danger and, and risk. Danger <clears throat> as a largely uh, involuntary exposure to potentially harmful circumstances. But, and this is uh, the, the point made by Knight, um, it is incalculable what the outcome will be because the probability distribution is unknown. And he distinguishes this from risks where there can be adverse or advantageous outcomes that are calculable with known probability distribution, which does not mean that everyone knows the probability distribution, of course not, but the, uh, but the probability distribution is known. And of course, these are not laws that are written in, in stone. We can see that we are uh, broadening the range of probability distributions that are known compared to the unknown ones. But nevertheless, it seems to me what got lost in the present discourse on risk and danger is the or. Risk can be positive or negative, advantageous or harmful in terms of outcome. And the word risk goes back to the Italian rischio. In the 13th century, this was the first kind of insurance or proto-insurance. And these were maritime traders in the Mediterranean who started to offer insurances for the wares, the freight that was sent on ships across the Mediterranean. And uh, you wanted to protect yourself from loss, but at the same time, um, <clears throat> there was also the positive outcome that the wares that you were shipping actually arrived where they were intended to arrive. And I just want to point out that uh, the Risk Society by Ulrich uh, Beck, uh, which again had an enormous influence, I think what this particular book did was to convert technological risks, namely the radiation exposure uh, to nuclear radioactive substances into dangers that are incalculable. And uh, therefore it should not be entitled risk society, but danger society. But that's just my, my take on it. So <clears throat> one way of um, looking to the future and we cannot do without it, is to ask my second question here, what is a promise and what does it do? Promises are ubiquitous. We cannot uh, live without hope, without promises, and already as children or as parents, uh, this is one of the ways of interaction between generations making promises, giving rewards, expecting promises uh, to be fulfilled, and building trust in them. So what is <clears throat> a, a promise? It's giving hope without hype. It gives you reason to expect something positive. But from the legal point of view, it's a legally binding commitment to do or not to do something in a specific way at a specific point in the future. And we also like to speak about the contract between science and society. If it ever has existed, I think this contract has become doubtful, doubted. And we therefore also have to ask ourselves what went wrong and perhaps uh, there were too many promises given that were not being kept. Now, we have been there before. <clears throat> this is not a spa of the 16th century, although it looks like one. 
Rather, it is one of the hopes of humankind. You step into the water uh, at a certain age and you come out as a young person. Famous picture by Lucas Granach. And <clears throat> this uh, kind of promise, uh, of course, is something that uh, humanity has cherished and continues uh, to cherish. We have changed the way how this promise is presented today. We are in the land of genomic promise. We see <clears throat> that we are getting a bit closer, or so it seems to us. And again, it's a promise that people are willing to believe and are willing uh, to act on it. When um, <clears throat> I wrote the, the book together with Giuseppe Testa on naked genes, we looked at, in particular, at two um, genetically based or modern life science based technologies. We looked at in vitro fertilization, which was largely accepted by society. But we also looked at the unending quest for human enhancement, as you see it in sports, <coughs> where it is very much pronounced in terms of the genomic promises of being able to select the particular athletic sport that people can be good in, etc. And this quest for human en enhancement, of course, continues. And all too rarely, in my mind, um, are we as scientists taking the time to step back and to ask ourselves which of the promises have been fulfilled and which have only partly been fulfilled. And there can be many good reasons why they have only partly been fulfilled and others remain unfulfilled. And this was one such occasion. This was <clears throat> the Nobel Week uh, Dialogue in 2012, which was held at the uh, 50, uh, 50 year celebration of the Nobel Prize going to Watson um, and, and Crick. And <clears throat> it, um, <clears throat> it, it provided a kind of forum engaging with citizens of Stockholm half of whom were students, to discuss you know, what was the basis of the promise and uh, what has science delivered and uh, what else has happened and why have some of the promises been perhaps too far stretched. Before coming here, I was at a conference in Bern where John Ioannidis was speaking. You probably, some of you may know his work about the uh, replicability crisis. He came up with, and he continues to write papers, how bad scientists, in particular in the biomedical uh, area, are of um, <clears throat> really being able to, to reproduce their, their results. And uh, John <clears throat> was giving us some uh, data there. He made a study of, uh, it, it was something like um, 1,400,000 1, abstracts um, where he was looking um, at the claims that there were statistically significant results in the papers. And then he looked, after a long stretch of time, what had happened. Uh, so everyone claims uh, there are significant uh, results to be expected. He also looked at um, PubMed uh, articles in six highly cited journals and looked at how much of these articles and their promises, their very concrete promises, what it would do, had actually been translated into clinical practice. And the result is a rather dismal one, at least according to John Ioannidis, in the sense that there is a glacial, glacial pace of clinical uh, translation going on. So something is amiss here in terms of promises, perhaps hype that is being made in these papers and what actually happens. Uh, for instance, among um, 100, uh, 100 highly promising novel technologies that he found in these highly cited impact journals and articles, there was only one that actually reached 
random clinical trial, and there were only one in five that were validated with a positive trial. So <clears throat> I want to close this part on what uh, a reflection, what does a promise do? A promise should be a match between expectations, anticipations, and what is actually being promised. It elicits hope and expectations, and as I said, without it, life would be miserable, and we cannot do without it. But if a promise is not fulfilled, it leads to disappointment, and it leads to a loss of trust to the person who has made the promise. Sometimes it leads to the loss of legitimacy. And my question here really is, would what we call citizen science involving lay persons, citizens, in the scientific process itself, would this not be a more realistic way of trying to match expectations and promises? And <clears throat> I am <clears throat> thinking here of um, you know, examples where <clears throat> citizens are uh, even made authors in scientific publications because they have given part of their body uh, but also their experience to an ongoing work in the medical area. And this uh, is much more than just presenting the citizens with uh, the outcome of research. And I think what we sometimes tend to do, to use a phrase by François Jacob, we tend to present to the public only the day science and not the night science. And the night science is the site of science where you have doubts, where you have delays, where the experiment does not work out the way you want. You have to start again. You have to be persistent, not to give up, and to share these kind of experiences with um, the public, I think would go one large uh, step towards better matching promises and expectations. Now, I think I have to hurry up, um, but I want to speak about policy as well. Mediating the tension between science <clears throat> and democracy. Um, and I think policy has the task of enhancing the beneficial outcomes, minimizing or, if possible, eliminating the harmful ones. Um, this is easily said, much more difficult to put into practice. We have seen the limits of citizens' participation, citizens' deliberations, all these experiments that have been going on to involve citizens. They have limits. <clears throat> but also governmental accountability has its limits. And at the end of the day, we have to admit there are winners and losers, like with other historical changes. This also happens with policy changes. And of course, um, we also have to take into account the um, burdens of regulation. The burdens of regulation with this vast and entangled arrangement of legislation, of court decisions that follow any legislation, of advisory committees, of assessments, of controversies, of um, citizens and uh, interest groups, etc., etc. Now, <clears throat> I <clears throat> uh, happened to, to come across a, a book again from 86 of the last century, which is a very long time indeed, written by Colin Rich and Reeve. Science Speaks to Power, I think the title is still very much um, uh, actual uh, title. And Collingridge and Reef take a very pessimis pessimistic view in this book, citing very concrete examples whenever science tries to influence policy of failing because uh, policymakers have to take more into account than just scientific advice. And according to them, it's only the incremental way um, that, that works. And what they call the regular, 
regulatory dilemma is that, in a sense, regulation always comes too late. Scientific and technological advances are too fast. If you want to regulate too much, you are constraining the space of innovation. And if you regulate too little, you will have a backlash afterwards. And in a sense, this is the dilemma that any policy and regulation still faces uh, today. But then there's also another interesting uh, side to it, namely national policies differ. And very few scientists, if they speak about scientific facts, they think the scientific facts must lead to the same kind of policy responses. This is not the case. There are very pronounced national differences. And uh, Sheila Jasanov, to take um, the last author here, she compared, for instance, the UK, the US, and Germany in terms of how these three democracies regulated biotechnologies. And the answer is in a very different way. If you look at <clears throat> the, the book by Gabriele Hecht, um, The Technopolitical Imaginaries and Regimes, uh, she wanted to know why the French saw no problem with nuclear power, while everyone else on continental Europe, at least, you know, had all kinds of misgivings against nuclear power. And part of her answer is this is very much linked to the way how the French conceive of France as a nuclear power. And then you use nuclear power for generating energy. And my colleague Ulrike Feld, she took the case of Austria, and uh, she makes the case that Austria, seeing itself as a political imaginary, as a neutral country, although our neutrality, I must say, is not worth very much anymore, but we still think ourselves and imagine ourselves to be a neutral country. And she links this to the very strong opposition against nuclear power, so we do not want to be contaminated by nuclear power, but also we are very much against GMOs because we want to be gene free, to use this absurd expression. But it is an emotional term of saying we want to be neutral. We do not want to have anyone colonizing ourselves. So <clears throat> this brings me to the framing of policy, the larger picture, something you're very much um, familiar with. Um, governments expecting uh, short-term economic returns, impact, the new public management, governance by numbers, the kind of monitoring, comparing, benchmarking, etc., that you have, in a, in a sense, um, been living with here for a very long time. And there is what I call numerical complexity reduction, uh, coping with complexity in terms, in terms of relying on numbers and forgetting that these numbers and indicators take on their eigendynamic. They are performative. They make you believe and act in a certain way just because these numbers and indicators exist. And there again <clears throat> is a lot of empirical work that has been done on the way how no one, once they are in the world, <coughs> these indicators, even if you know how they have been constructed, they take on a life of their own and no one is able to control them. And this is linked to their performativity. So <clears throat> assessing future impact as part of policy, let me just remind you, impact is a military term. You want to hit a well-defined target with a maximum of efficiency and uh, uh, impact, uh, precision and effectiveness. Now, <clears throat> targets uh, in science policy, of course, have their place. There are very big missions like moon landing, or recently the Human Brain Project, the flagship uh, that has the aim, <clears throat> a bit like the moon landing, in 10 years, uh, we should have computers that can simulate the human brain. Whether it will be achieved is another question, but the target is there. Um, but what if the target cannot be uh, precisely defined? And this is the case for most of the research we are engaged in. It's true for the 4,000 projects that the ESC has been funded. 
There is no target in that sense that can be um, impacted. And if you compare in the, the, the US war on cancer with its huge mobilization of researchers and the huge promises and hype that went with it, uh, <clears throat> which did not lead to very much. Researchers were very clever in changing uh, the labeling of the research they were doing in order to get federal funding. But uh, if you compare it to the recent progress in cancer research, you see it is based on the way how science has progressed, that we can now compare the genomes of different types of cancers, and this is the way how um, the goal, which of course remains the same, of having a better way of um, dealing with cancer has been uh, reached. And I will not go into the long list of technological uh, predictions that have failed, mainly because the use to which they are put <coughs> cannot be predicted. So, <clears throat> If one is focused too much on assessing this future impact, I think um, it narrows the options and space for discovery because you are focusing on one target. It expels surprise, it leaves no room for serendipity, and we know how important serendipity is in the research process finding something that you have not been looking for, but you recognize the importance of what you have found. And as Abram Flexner, uh, <clears throat> one of the um, founders of the Princeton Institute in 39, called it the motto, the usefulness of seemingly useless knowledge. And this is what fundamental research is all about. So let me now <clears throat> take you to uh, publics and uh, the collective imaginaries what you call here the center, the public dimension of science and innovation. And here um, we in the STS field, we have moved through a public understanding of science, showing that this was a misunderstanding on the part of scientists. We moved to public uh, awareness of science, to public engagement of science. And the question is what comes next. And <clears throat> this uh, little dialogue is the summary of one of the Pew, uh, Pew surveys. And as you can see, it's all about people, it's about science, and it's about who cares. And I think this is at issue, who cares, and it's people and science. And where is the place of people in our knowledge is the question that underlies such a, uh, such a dialogue. Now, <clears throat> evidence-based policy seems to be the answer, in particular here uh, in this country, and who can be against evidence? But historians of science have been looking at the way how the notions of proof and the notions of evidence have changed. There's Laren uh, Dastan's work on the history of objectivity. It was not always clear that science was objective. There was a long historical road to it, and it keeps on changing with simulation taking over so much. The, the way how mathematicians are judging which proof is admitted or not has changed with the advent of the computer, and there were heated controversies. Would you admit a mathematical proof that was arrived with the help of the computer or not, and so on. So all this is to say that it is not clear at all. It's not an essential quality that evidence is there, but we have to ask <coughs> whose evidence is it? How has it been assembled? By whom? In which context? And in the policy field, you very often take a decontextualized evidence, you put it into a different context, and you believe it should work. But very often, it does not work. And of course, <clears throat> we have the national policy boundaries, but also the question, does it not deepen the lay and expert um, divide? And <clears throat> here, I just want to um, remind you of an old uh, philosophical concept brought up by the philosopher Husserl in 36. 
It was the book, The Crisis of European Science. It was written against what he saw already, the rise of fascism in Germany. And he was asking himself, you know, why can not science hold and stand up against this tide of irrational uh, wave of, uh, of, of the fascists. And <clears throat> he wanted to alert everyone to this gap between scientific explanation and the experience of today's life world. And what he meant by this, and being a phenomenologist, uh, it was the evidence through the senses, through cognitive everyday processes that are different from the way how scientists think and work. And he also emphasized there is a reality check, the, the life world is evaluated, but through intersubjective experience. Today we would say it happens through the social media, it happens through talking to your peers, um, etc. And whenever scientific evidence meets life world evidence, we get an ambivalent mixture. Um, and we see this varies with domain, it varies with the sense of control, which is very important. Is the life experience one that tells you you, can, you have a choice or you have no choice? And um, it also is related to how much, uh, which importance it has in one's life. I'm sorry, I pushed the wrong, uh, the wrong one. Um, so <clears throat> if the gen genomic revolution is here, are you ready? Is the life world ready or not? That's the question. But there are also changing changes in the public image of science. You both, uh, you, you, these, both, uh, these uh, publications are all known to you. They appeared just two days, one after the other. The one <coughs> speaks about the <coughs> peer review system bursting at the seams. This is the, what the nature um, issue is all about. And the other one speaks about the replicability crisis. And it raises questions like, can science still validate and certify scientific results? Something that publication means. Uh, you publish something that has been validated by peer review. So it is something that can be, uh, uh, can be certified in the public domain. Question of how open access will change the public image of science but also the contradictions that will arise by everyone having access to more and more scientific information and f new forms like crowdfunding and citizen science. Now this is a picture <coughs> familiar to you and it is <coughs> a way of institutionalizing reassurance. The chief um, scientific advisor and um, Robert Doubleday here and James Wilson are the authors of this article. Um, <clears throat> what is interesting from my point of view is whether the chief scientific advisor is um, a product of a particular culture, sorry for the misprint, uh, of one pot political culture, um, or whether it can be also uh, imported, exported to other contexts. And here I have very much my doubts whether it would work at EU level. So let me now <clears throat> come, this is a last thought on the collective imaginaries, which I think have to be taken into account uh, here. This is uh, Yaron Etzrachi, a political scientist um, in, in Israel. And he makes the very important point that in the history, until now, very often, external reality as portrayed by science was taken as the reference point for the political order. It was used and it was abused as when slavery or the suppression of women was justified being in natural order by looking at what people saw to be the natural uh, order. And he uh, thinks that we are now moving from the <coughs> world of images in which we live to reality, which gives much more role to these collective imaginaries. And he thinks that we should um, be able to choose which of these collective imaginaries should really be our guiding uh, imaginaries to shape common life. So I come to the end, and I will be very briefly, the cunning of uncertainty. 
This is where the ESC comes in. I think science thrives on uncertainty <coughs> and frontier research is about the uncertainty that is inherent in science. You do not know as yet what you will find. You're being pushed towards certainty, but uh, you know that even the certainty that you may reach will be a temporal one as everything in science, and we believe that can be revised if there is a better science to replace <coughs> it. And the question really is if science can thrive on uncertainty, why is it so difficult to convey this to society? to let society also thrive on the kind of uncertainty. And this would mean learning to embrace uncertainty in society. It would mean to make uh, the public uh, see also this openness of the system, which is an evolving system, not just in biological terms, but in cultural terms. But uncertainty is also cunning in the sense <clears throat> that it enters through errors. We know errors play an important role in mutations in biology, but errors also play an important role in very successful organizations. James March, the organizational uh, theorist and empiricist, has written about it. Successful organizations do best if they just repeat doing what they are good at, and yet, they do innovate, and they do innovate because errors creep in, and this is another cunning of uncertainty. So I will <clears throat> leave you with these two quotations which uh, may perhaps sum up uh, the cunning of uncertainty it does not mean anything goes. It means that in the end um, either your theory agrees with the experiment or it does not, and that's all there is to it. Richard Feynman and <clears throat> Sir Karl Popper, who reminds us that knowledge continues to evolve and we do not know as yet what we will know in the future. Thank you very much. Well, I'm thank sorry you. for being so. Thank you so much for an excellent lecture. I want to throw this open to discussion, but there are microphones that will be coming around. But I'd like you to please identify yourself uh, when you pose questions. So who would like to start? Let me take Chairman's prerogative then. Yes. How do you see the burgeoning of mass communication actually impacting, because citizen science could not take off without actually mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. evolution of mm -hmm. communications. Mm -hmm. But we're also seeing in the world of communications an increasing trend on opinion rather than fact in that communication space. How do you see the fact that maybe uninformed opinion can actually mm -hmm. sway the perspective mm -hmm. rather than actually having an objective argument yeah. uh, in, in the way that you perceive? Well, I, I, I think um, we are in the middle of a transition period. Mass communication of the new social media kind, the internet-based communication, has just exploded. And as always with such um, transformations towards something new, there are some very good sides to it and there are some very bad sides to it. And I think it will very much um, depend are we able to, con and if I say we, it's from the science side, to convey that quality and quality control is not just a luxury that scientists you know, indulge because they speak to each other and, uh, and so on, but rather it's the basis for uh, making things work. Mm. And uh, I think citizens can be convinced that um, you do not want to become prey to a quack. You want also to have some kind of uh, basis for knowing that it will work. And I think this sense of quality, again, um, would be easier to convey if we open up the research process and not just mm. showing outcomes. The, the glorious results that we present at the end of the day science day, but rather to you know, let them in, let them experience. Um, it's not that easy as we sometimes uh, convey it, but uh, it's a process. 
So it's the opening up that yeah. uh, is, is at yeah. the heart of it. Yeah. Martin, I think you might want to raise. Thank you. I'm not work. Okay. Uh, I'm Martin Bobro. I used to be a medical geneticist once. So you paint a slight picture of science as a disappointment to society and of conflict and tension between them. And I, I wonder whether there isn't a converse worry, which is that science is almost becoming a new religion. Uh, you speak of it as though it were a monolithic object with its cult figures who speak authoritatively, and the pronouncement of individual scientists, their opinions, are taken seriously while not bothering to verify their facts and to make sure that one understands what they're saying. So I'm old enough mm. to remember the early days of the public engagement of science phase, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. where the real worry was that the public didn't ever seem to know science existed. We worried that there was nothing in the newspapers. Mm -hmm. Now you can't get away from it, but it's mm. all overdone. It's superficial mm. and it's glib, and it looks at the self-promoters, but it gives no publicity to the much larger number of people in the science who sit in the background where I've been myself all my life, saying it's not going to be like that, and they just ignore you. They listen to the one person who says, five years and the world will be upside down. So I, I think there's a problem of credibility of the people who, who talk about science rather than of science itself. Of course, um, one has to make many distinctions. Science, scientists, science is not a, a monolithic block, of course not. But I think it's related to the question that you posed. I mean, the, the, the modern media go for, a, uh, for simplification. And they also have this wrong idea that if you have two scientists, one is for and one is against uh, <clears throat> something, this is enough, and you don't ask you know, the one who is for or against something, maybe a tiny, tiny minority. He or she may even be a quack. Also, this happens, and we, we know examples that, uh, that have happened. And the media think they are fair, uh, in quotations, if they present both sides. And I think here, um, the scientific community has to get engaged also with the media and has to make it clear to the media. Now, there's another interesting um, process going on that concerns <clears throat> the way how science communication is being shifted to uh, science journalism is being shifted to science communication. And so the media have less and less space to present science, serious science, so therefore you focus on one person, you have a picture, you have one sentence, that's it. But I think this is not tenable over, uh, over, over time. And there is the switch from science journalism to science communication, which is much more in the hands of scientists. But again, if we fall into the trap of just presenting the glorious side only, <laughs> and not being fair also in terms of, this is why I showed you this picture of the Nobel Dialogue Week, you know, to say, yes, there have been all these promises and uh, you, you can read it because it's, it's, it's all on record, but some promises we have kept and others we have not been able to keep. And some promises have changed in the nature of uh, the objective and so on. So I think we also have to become more proactive there. We have a question back. Um, Julian Norwood, I'm an engineer. I work on uh, problems to do with mitigating climate change and resource stress. Um, and in both of those areas, we already have all of the solutions that we need mm -hmm. if we choose to follow demand reduction strategies. But instead, in public, in science, mm. in policy, we're all hoping for a technological miracle that allows us to keep expanding our demand uh, and not have to change our behavior. The Limits to Growth agenda has clearly failed to motivate the public to change. So how do we do it? How do we engage the public, the policy sphere, even our colleagues in science, in a discussion about demand reduction and not on technological miracles? I must admit I don't know the answer. <laughs> <laughs> 
what I observe <coughs> is <coughs> the <coughs> there is no sing simple and single uh, solution. In the case of uh, <coughs> smoking and lung cancer, you know, you have a si seemingly simple, straightforward link. <coughs> and even if it took a very long time to get bans on smoking, etc., but this was clear. In <coughs> the climate change area, it is such a complex picture, which is also hard to convey, and there are still many things, the role of oceans, acidification, etc., you know it all. None of this can be easily translated and linked to a particular action. So you have this enormous global complexity. Then <clears throat> the added layer of difficulty comes that we need global action. And there uh, <clears throat> are even some, um, th there, there was one philosopher who was the only philosopher in the IPCC report. <clears throat> and he <clears throat> made a point in saying, you as an individual, whatever you do, it makes no difference whatsoever. Devastating to, you know, the kind of messages that you want to give. <clears throat> and he said, the only ways, <clears throat> if you can, have governments acting and governments acting on the global level. Now, this may be <clears throat> a debatable uh, action course to follow, but how do you get governments to act together at the global level? We just had the failure of the Warsaw Conference, which was blatant, even though it, it occurred at the same time. So everything is being delayed and, and, and pushed out again. So I, I can only say I do not know. Teresa. Uh, Theresa Marte, psychologist, thank you very much for a very stimulating lecture. Um, as a psychologist, I want to suggest to you that uncertainty is quite an uncomfortable position. And I wanted to challenge you a little bit when you said that science thrives on uncertainty. Well, most scientists, or many scientists, I don't know the figures, um, are not actually setting out to disprove their theories. Um, so I think the, the kinds of scientists that we really want are the dispassionate scientists, the evidence synthesizers, of whom John Ernidas is, you know, the, the, the primary example. So somebody who doesn't have uh, a horse in the race, as it were. So the people who are dispassionate about a particular theory, running a particular lab, they're interested in what is the effect size. So. Of course, <clears throat> you need both, but I would like to give a positive connotation to uncertainty. I know you can say uncertainty, you know, it threatens you and uh, people don't like it and people want to have norms and uh, to go by and I want to open up and I think this is one of the tremendous advantages that science has that no other institution has. It has the long-term view, it has the openness towards the future, and the openness towards the future comes with uncertainty. And by thriving at the cusp of uncertainty, I mean precisely this kind of feeling. Now, of course, as I said, you need verification, you need the experiment, you have to be sure things work. You want to turn the uncertainty into some kind of certainty, but then you are pushed out again to go for the next uncertainty, to turn it into certainty. And this is the kind of spirit that I think science should convey to society, to take it with it towards this openness, towards the future. David. And I'm passionate about it. <laughs> David and Tom. So, uh, David, David Cleveley, the founding director of the Center for Science and Policy. Um, not many politicians get elected by saying, well, I'm not really sure. Mm -hmm. And a lot of politicians do not like being interviewed by the press where they say, Minister, can you give us a guarantee that this will be the outcome? Surely that's the bit of uncertainty that dictates how we treat science. If you look at uh, public opinion polls, whatever they are worth, uh, it and uh, you have to treat them in a, in a differentiated way. I think this is one of the reasons why politicians don't rank very high in terms of trust, while scientists do. 
And uh, the public, of course, understands that uh, politicians want to calm them down. They want to give them assurances, which, and there are times when this is absolutely necessary. But then, if the public discovers that these assurances were only one part, you know, disappointment sets in and distrust sets in. And uh, therefore, it's a very, very narrow uh, way to, to, to tread on it. But, uh, you know, I, I agree. This is for a politician to be able to say, I do not know. It takes courage and it takes stamina to really pull it through. On the other hand, uh, I think uh, it, our political system is not in such a good shape wherever we look. And uh, the inner workings of democracy, I think, would benefit of uh, some greater honesty. Yeah. Tom. Uh, Tom Blundler in Biochemistry in Cambridge. I wanted to also address this question of uncertainty um, in society and by scientists. I, I don't agree with your distinction of the two. Uh, I don't think they're different. And I was one of the few scientists, I guess, who spent several years in, well, in local politics in the other place in Oxford. And uh, that experience uh, made me understand how difficult it was. Because in society demands an answer, they don't choose questions where you can find an answer. So I was always challenged uh, when we were dealing with uh, planning issues, for example, um, in Oxford, uh, whether we should pedestrianise the centre, which we did, make North Oxford a conservation area. I, I was always challenged uh, to make a view and then uh, keep to it. Whereas as a scientist, I always have the choice of choosing the area that I'm going to work on uh, and where I think I have a solution. Of course, when I'm forced in, as a scientist in policy, as I was by the mad cow disease, where I was responsible 20 years ago uh, for much of the funding in that area, I then found myself back in that difficult time of dealing with uncertainty. Of course, we recognize it, but I don't think we like it. <laughs> there may be individual differences, uh, I, I agree, but um, I did not want to uh, give the impression here that all you need to do is to say, you know, uncertainty is good for you. Uh, this, is, uh, <clears throat> this is not what, uh, what my message was. I think uh, if in policy terms you are able to begin to say we do not have the one certain solution. There are several options, and the options, as we all know, need to be clearly delineated, and you need to be able to say the options have these advantages, these disadvantages. Or you can even do a cost-benefit analysis if you go down on the economic road. But then at least the options are clear. The uncertainty is still there because the future is not limited by choosing one option. And I think if people know they have several options, this loss of control that you know, comes out of some of these uh, data here is at least partly, partly restored because if people are given options, you do have some control in saying, I would rather go in this direction than in, the, in that direction. But then again, I would say honesty demands to say, you know, the solution per se, just does not exist. There are several solutions, and this is <clears throat> something that needs to be spelled out. But this feeling of um, uncertainty as something positive uh, is, is for me this opening towards the future and saying we do not know, but we take the next step, and for the next step you have two or three or four options. Time for a couple more questions. Um, mm. Ian Manning, I'm a county councillor and actually did just get re-elected and did often say I don't know the answer to, to certain Great. things. Um, <laughs> interestingly enough, though, I mean, I take David's point, but um, I was against somebody who was very keen to say that, that they did know the answer a lot of the time and there were quite complex things going on. I think that actually helped 
in a way. Um, but the question I actually want to ask is how much of the, the problems you talked about, um, the influence of science on policy, how much do you think that's actually just got to do with the fact that democracy itself is incredibly uncertain? The what? Dem dem democracy, democracy itself is incredible. Uh, you know, from the point of view of the individual mm. person mm. who may vote a certain way, but then somebody else gets voted in, and to them that's, that's, a, that's a measure of uncertainty. I, I, I agree. I agree. Uh, <clears throat> there is uh, a lot, when I said, you know, our democracies are not that healthy, this is one part of it. And also the way how people um, feel that, um, you know, at one, uh, one level, we all speak about empowering people. And we tell them, be it in the environment, be it in other areas, you can do something yourself. And at the same time, people realize how um, <clears throat> narrow sometimes the scope is of what they actually are willing to do, what they believe in, and how it will translate. Yeah. And the last question. Um, Injin, I'm an architect. Um, am I right to understand you to say that uh, you want to turn science into something like um, democracy? Democracy is like uh, a raft compared with uh, a boat. The raft will not sink, but uh, your feet are always um, wet. <laughs> no, <I> and <laughs> now, th your system, uh, whether your system will work, will depend on um, whether people uh, like their feet to be wet. And is that so? Uh, well. <laughs> Uh, sticking to the metaphor, you know, <laughs> we would be in a very uh, bad situation if all we have is a raft uh, and be somewhere out on high sea. It's still better to have a raft than no raft, but, you know, I would prefer not to have a raft if I can have a boat. And <clears throat> I don't want to turn science into democracy. I see them as something distinct. And this is why I speak about the tension and the necessity for policy to mediate between science and democracy. In science, you do not, uh, you do not vote, you do not have a system where you have representation of your, be it your young people, your old people, whatever. Uh, it is a different set of values, but there are values in science and science itself is based on a societal value, namely free inquiry. Let's not forget that. Without this societal value, and there are societies in history and uh, even existing today, where free scientific inquiry is not tolerated. So you need this democratic fundamental, this basic assumption on which science must be built. But then, of course, science is not isolated. Science works in a democracy, and science has to come to some kind of agreement with democracy. I wrote <clears throat> one book called Insatiable Curiosity, mm -hmm. with curiosity as the driving force of science. And uh, in this book, I make the point that no society can ever tolerate <laughs> to let scientific or artistic curiosity go completely unregulated. Because curiosity is a passion. Curiosity takes you wherever you don't know where, but you keep on going, <clears throat> and no society can tolerate that. So every society is trying to tame curiosity, which is risky. Because if you tame it too much, the goose that lays the golden eggs will stop laying golden eggs. So scientific curiosity being cut down will really bring you down to zero benefits from science. And uh, in the book I distinguish three different um, discourses that this taming has taken. One is the innovation discourse, so you channel scientific curiosity into innovation. You say, this is the way to go. And you tame it by saying, this is the way to go. You have the risk discourse, <clears throat> part of which <clears throat> you know, has to do 
<coughs> with the way how societies can cope with risk. We have the precautionary principle, whether it works or not is another matter. But we have this kind of discourse, and we have the most difficult discourse of them all, which is the moral discourse. And it's the most difficult, <coughs> and stem cell <coughs> are a very good example, because you have one part of society that says our values are non-negotiable. And this, of course, is not tenable in a plural democracy. But this is another way of taming. Well, Professor mm. Novotny, it really falls on me to thank you enormously for an excellent STLE lecture here at the university. Sometimes I wonder whether we expect the human brain to do too much as I was listening to you. <laughs> you know, I think of it as a very simple organ, really. The two things you can do if you've got a lion in front of you, you can run towards it or away from it. <laughs> Evolution dictates if you run towards it, you're not going to last very long. Um, and so one dominates. But we have amazingly complex systems that you introduce us to. The complex system of society and how it wishes to regulate uh, a system and the system of science, which in essence wishes to challenge uh, at all times. What you also showed us, I think, is a beautiful way of where places such as this have a huge role to play. A, we have to get to understand the relative balance of, uh, of science, society, and how we can actually influence it. And yet, in your last slide, I thought you actually exemplified probably two better aphorisms that I could not think of for the university. And Karl Popper got it right so often that knowledge will always continue to evolve and we don't yet know what we will know in the future. Mm. And that is why places like this, I think, have a role today, will have a role tomorrow, and we have to listen to spokesmen like you. And many of us hope that the leadership that you show in this domain is something that encourages us to continue to take forward and to take this dialogue forward with society. Because at the end of the day, we will be regulated by society whether we want to or not. And you showed that beautifully today. Thank you very much for a wonderful lecture. Thank you. Thank you.